All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. So uh, I wanted to talk t today about some of the work that's going on in the Hive community in, in Phoenix and in HBase to kind of make these things work together. So um, kind of the, the goal here is to think about how could we take what's happening in Hive, in HBase, Phoenix, and Calcite, and I'll talk about what each of those are, and kind of blend that work together, make that work together well. Um, before we get there, we're going to take a little road trip through kind of some of the current work going on in those things that'll lay the groundwork to help you understand, uh, you know, why this makes sense or, or how this could be done. So there'll be part of this talk that'll be, you know, what's going on now in those areas. And then toward the end, I'll get to some kind of vision stuff of where we'd like, th where, where we think that could go, right? Where that makes sense to, to take going forward. So um, first, some things going on in Hive. Uh, just to lay the groundwork, a little bit of history. Um, as I think probably everybody knows at this point, initially Hive was a, an easy way to execute MapReduce jobs on SQL, right? Or sorry, SQL, <laughs> write your query in SQL, execute MapReduce jobs on Hadoop. That's what it started out as all batch. Everything was pretty, you know, took minutes or hours to run. That's fine because that's what it was aimed at doing. These are mostly ETL type workloads. Right, you're doing things that are going to take a long time. That was a great beginning. Um, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of transformation in Hive, uh, really starting with Hive 0.11. Uh, there's been a big move toward making Hive work for um, more interactive queries. Right, Instead of just doing batch, certainly we still want it to work with batch, but now we need to make it work also in the interactive space where People are sitting there doing queries, or maybe a tool is doing queries very frequently to present data to people for visualization or, or what have you. And so a lot of work has gone on in there. Um, new file formats like Orc and Parquet, uh, new execution engines, because MapReduce isn't your friend if you want to be very fast with uh, kind of interactive response times. So you think. Uh, Tez or um, Works also gone on to put Spark in there. Um, a rewrite of the operators inside, which we call vectorization, which in a nutshell is making it so that the operators work on thousands of records at a time that all fit in the cache instead of operating on one record at a time. Um, and this has shown some very nice results, right? As of Hive 14, which is uh, released late last year, uh, we could do queries on very small data sets, and I want to be clear that the 200 gigabyte is very small. This is just to really test, you know, how fast can we go when there's effectively no data in the system. Um, on 200 gigabytes, we can return in nine seconds, and for a 30 terabyte data set, we can return in 32 seconds. So it's maybe not everywhere we want to be, but it's, um, it's much, much faster than it was. It's, you know, different um, than where Hive came from. But there's still a floor of about two to five seconds for all Hive queries. We just, the way it's, the system works right now, you can't really get rid of that in the current versions of Hive. So a lot of the work right now in the Hive community is how do we get rid of that two to five second floor? How do we move it to where it is um, truly interactive, where you're going to get a sub-second response time? So we'll talk about some of the um, work going on there to, to make that happen. And trust me, this is all going to come back into the Hive plus HBase stuff. This is important groundwork to figure out why, you know, how, how can all this work together? So one of the first things we want to do for that is a project called LLAP, which stands for uh, Live Long and Process. And it really is a joke off of the, you know, the Vulcan uh, Live Long and Prosper. This is why you don't ever, ever let your engineers name your projects. Um, this, so this is what happens when you, let, when you do that. Uh, every time we say that, I think the marketing department at Hortonworks cringes. You know, they get, it's not their favorite thing. Um, so why do we need to do this? And I'll, um, I'll talk a little bit about what it is in a minute, but basically what, what problem are we trying to solve here? And there's a couple problems we're trying to 
trying to solve. One is that with the data engines like Tez, or sorry, the execution engines like Tez, it's hard to be both fast and flexible. Um, Tez can be very fast once it's spun up, but it takes a second or two to spin it up. And that's just kind of the nature of how Hadoop works. Um, when you submit a Hadoop job, it has to go spin up an, uh, an AM, the application master, that takes a second or two. You just can't get, you, know, you can't launch a Java process faster than that. And then it has to launch some containers. So you, you're, you've got a couple seconds at least of overhead there. So what can you do about that? Now Tez can reuse containers across session, or sorry, across queries. So once you pay that spin up cost once, you can, you know, your subsequent queries can go faster. But now you've got problems of how do I manage that, how many containers I own, right? What if your first query is small, your next query is big, your next query is small? Um, how, do I, how do I manage that? Tez can do that today, but it, it's got two models. It can pre-allocate the containers you're going to need so that you're fast, but then that's a little harder on the flexible side, right? You're taking up a lot of resources. Some you may need, some you may not, um, at least for every query. Or you can allocate and release for each query you're flexible, you're a better citizen in the cluster, but you're, you're gonna pay more on the startup costs for each query, right? So we need to figure out how we fine tune that to give you flexibility so that you're not burning resources you don't need, um, and at the same time give you um, speed so that those queries can be interactive. Also, one of the downsides of the way um, Tez works today is you don't get the advantage of caching. Right? So if you've got a bunch of queries all hitting the same data set, they're each going to be getting assigned to those uh, whatever HDFS nodes the data's on. They're going to be reading that data, but they're each doing the work of getting it off disk. Now, if they're all going to the same nodes, they're pro it's probably in the OS cache, so you may at least get that. Um, however, a fair amount of the cost in getting data to ready to go through Hive's pipeline isn't actually... Um, the lifting the bits off disk, it's actually getting everything marshaled and ready to go through the operator pipeline. So if we had some way to cache this data, if we had something that could cache the hot data sets, then we can, we can start to serve those queries much, much faster. So what is LLAP? Um, the, the, the reason it's called live long and process is it's a resident daemon. So you can put this on your, um, on your data nodes and it actually lives long hence, and keeps uh, serving this data. So it is not, um, well, actually, let me back up just a second. It's multi-threaded, so it can handle multiple jobs all at the same time. As I um, indicated by saying it needs a cache, it can actually cache the data, not just in terms of caching bits off disk, but actually cached, ready, in, uh, properly marshaled to go through Hive's ex, uh, execution pipeline so that it's very fast and ready to go. Um, and you can also push down uh, some of the operator process, some of the operator pipeline into this. So let's say you had a query that you first needed to project out just certain columns, apply a filter, and then you were going to group it. So the grouping is going to re require you to shuffle data across uh, nodes, right? Because you're going to have you know some records with your key are over going to be over here, and some are going to be over there. You're going to have to do a shuffle, but you can push down the the projections so that you only get the right columns out of this. There's no reason it needs to read all the columns. You can push down the filtering into this so that you, maybe you're only looking for users in the state of California, for example. There's no reason you can't push that into this so that it's reading the, as it's reading the data, it's, um, it's getting the right records out. You can even have this thing do the initial aggregation. You know, there's no reason it can't aggregate the records it does have, even though it's not going to have a complete key. Um, and so that's it, a way to think about this is it's a, in the old MapReduce world, we would have called this a standing map server. In fact, when we were first talking about it, that's what we called it. Um, so the, the idea here is the initial processing you're going to do can be done inside here before you shuffle. Um, and again, this can be done on cache data and because this system understands the, um, the nature of the data, it can even only cache the parts that are hot, right? Rather than being like HDFS where I can just say cache this file, 
I can say, okay, cache these columns because that's the one everybody's reading. You know, it turns out that people very rarely maybe read a certain column, so we won't cache that one. That's the kind of things you can, you can get here. So it looks, in a system it would look like this, where you're gonna have it running on multiple nodes, a Hive query is gonna get spread across those just as it would today. The thing to understand here is we're not, this won't do all the processing. Post shuffle, you know, once this data goes out of LLAP because it's, you're gonna aggregate or join or whatever you need to do that you have to shuffle data for, this is still gonna be run by Tez or whatever your execution is, engine is in the background, right? So this is not, um, it's not a full MPP system. It's not a, you know, we're not gonna shuffle data between these nodes. We're only using these to start stuff off so that you can get that lower latency. And so that, um, and, but you can still be expandable in the background, right? Because one, um, one of the kind of design limitations of a system that only has standing servers is it has a hard time being flexible in the face of different sized jobs. As you get big jobs, now you have to start, you've got very limited resources here, you have to manage all that. This can run as a standard, you know, in the more standard Hadoop way where we may start the jobs off here, but then we can spawn additional containers behind to, to execute that job as we need to using Tez or whatever your execution engine is. So, as I just said, it's not quite traditional MPP, it's much more of a hybrid system between MPP and Hadoop. Um, this isn't a replacement for your execution engine for Tez or Spark. It, you would still use those post shuffle to do whatever, um, you know, any of those operations such as joins, sorts, aggregates, any of that stuff is still done in that engine. And in fact, the engine needs to be integrated with LLAP to understand what's coming, you know, what data is gonna be coming out of there and what it's gonna be getting. Um, obviously, we're not gonna make it required. You can still use Hive without it if you want. And um, this is currently under development. In Hive, you can go, there's an LLAP branch in the Hive source code. You can go take a look at this, um, play with it. Uh, our hope is to merge this into the master branch here and do a very early release of it uh, sometime next month so that people, and I just wanna be clear, it'll be very early. It will definitely be alpha, but the intent will be just to get it in people's hands, let you play with it, get feedback, um, you know, help you see what's good and what needs fixed in it. All right, so now let me talk about one other thing that's happening in Hive before I move on to the other stuff. Um, I, I mentioned that for that, one TPC DS query that we like to use as, a, as our benchmark, it took us nine seconds to process 200 gigs of data. It, 200 gigs very easily fits in memory in the system we were playing with, so it's, that's pretty much like running the system empty just to see what are the constraints, basically, what's kind of minimum times I can run things in the system. And in this particular query, um, which by the way, this query 27 here is just, uh, it's a star join followed by a group and an order. Um, so this is, this uh, pie chart here kind of breaks down where we spend in time of those 13 seconds, or I think I said nine before, sorry, 13, whatever it is. Um, this is where we're spending time. So 27% of that time is in just in actually generating the plan. Well, that's not good. If we said we want to get to multi, or sorry, uh, sub-second, if we're spending three seconds planning how we're going to do the query, well, we've already lost, right? Um, then about half the time roughly spent in the scan and join uh, the orange part there, broadcast tables, that's actually doing broadcasting out the dimension tables for the join. And uh, finally, the 9% there is the group by, that's kind of the post-shuffle work. So LLAP will address the red and the orange parts of this pie chart and work to shrink those. But even if we shrink those very nicely so that they're nice and small so we can serve this query very quickly, we still have a problem if the planning section takes three seconds, right? So if I think I said this was 13 seconds total, if 28% of that's roughly three seconds. Um, so what are we gonna do about that? We, we need to solve that too. So we, we've done a lot of analysis on where are we spending time in planning? What is, you know, is this the optimizer taking too long? Is this, is something else going wrong? And um, the vast majority of that time is actually an interaction with our Metastore, with the database, server trying to figure out, okay, what, how are we actually gonna run this query? So, um, why is that? Um, Hive actually stores its metadata in a uh, relational database, and it goes through an ORM layer to do that, because that's kind of the standard way you go from 
objects to relational. And the result is this. Um, that's 40 some tables. I don't remember exactly, 42, 43, something like that, to track the different, um, the nine or 10 different types of objects that Hive actually understands in its Metastore. Um, as you can see by all the lines here, when you want to access any one object, you end up doing either a lot of queries or a lot of joins. If, um, for example, to fetch all the relevant information about a particular partition of a hive table, you have to touch seven different tables inside the Metastore to make that happen. Um, that's not ideal, obviously. Um, and that's before you get to statistics. That's just grabbing the, um, the, the actual metadata or the actual you know, object data for the partition. When you add in statistics, it gets much, much worse. And when you, like that TPCDS query, um, you're touching, I think it's 1,800 partitions. So you have to load that data for all 1,800 of those partitions. Then you have to turn around and load statistics from it. And the result is the planning that one query actually takes more than 700 hits against the, the relational database. No wonder we're taking three seconds, right? At that point, you look at it and go, wow, I'm impressed we can manage it in only three seconds. So obviously this, you know, we need to solve this. This isn't, this isn't what you want to see. So um, what are the issues here and how might we address these? So one of, them, one of the things to notice is just object relational modeling, ORM, which is the way this is usually done is, it's just an impedance mismatch. You're going from objects to relations. Both of those are optimized for a certain set of problems, but translating between them is just a little bit difficult. It's a, you know, it's a little bit like trying to read poetry that's translated out of a foreign language. I'm sure it was good in the original language. It just doesn't work as well when you bring it into your language. Um, Hive also works across multiple uh, relational databases. So um, it, you can support MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, SQL Server, and Derby, all out of Hive. This is very good because when people have a relational database in their system, they want, um, they want it to be one they already know about, right? When you, go, when you bring Hive into your, uh, into your company or wherever you're running it, you, you don't want to have to bring in a new database system, right? You, you, maybe you're already, you, know, you already are an Oracle user or you're already comfortable with Postgres, whatever, you just want to use that. That's great, but it also uh, limits your tuning opportunities. You can't optimize this for a single database. You can't start writing, you know, hand coding SQL around your database. Well, actually you can, and we have done some of that in the Metastore, which is what convinced us we should stop. Because um, you do that for a while, and then you go insane, and you say, okay, I'm just not gonna do that anymore. Um, there's also very little effective caching of objects or stats in the Metastore. Um, that you could obviously solve. Um, and here's a big one that we realized was holding us back is because of the scale of Hadoop, one of the rules all along has been don't touch the relational database from the cluster ever. Do all your query planning up front because then you've got a single client interacting with the Metastore. You don't have potentially hundreds or thousands of nodes hammering on that one database, which not every, you know, a lot of databases can't manage very well. Um, that's fine, except that it, it does a couple things to you. One, it forces all your planning up front. So things where you might be able to delay a decision to later, if you could think about it later, you can't. You have to decide up front because you have to go get that information, um, which means that you're pushing all that time up front when maybe you could actually be doing that in the background while you're processing other stuff. You could be parallelizing that. Basically, you're serializing something that you might be able to parallelize otherwise. The other thing is we're limiting our caching opportunities. We're up. We're to a point now in the amount of statistics that we want to stash that we just can't keep them all in a relational database at the scale we want to. We want to start um, doing things like caching some of the footers from the files that the data is actually stored in because those footers have indexes about what records are where in the file. We, we just don't have room for that in a relational database. So our proposed solution here is to, to use HBase instead for this metadata. So um, with HBase, obviously, it's just a key value store. We can serialize objects directly and stick them in there. We're not forced into normalizing them. Um, it already scales and performs at the Hadoop load. That's what it's built for. And that, that really means we can start to put more and more data in there. We can put more stats in there. We can cache a lot more aggressively. And it's not gonna fall over if um, LLAP or 
Tez or whatever your execution engine is wants to ask it a question. If you want to do some, you know, if you want to say cache those file footers with the indexes in them and you need to read that on the, um, in your container to decide what parts of the file to read, that's fine. HBase is going to handle hundreds of clients hitting it at the same time. That, you know, that's its world. So, um, there's, I, I don't want to paint a completely rosy picture. There's some things uh, between here and there. Um, HBase doesn't have transactions, and the Metastore is transactional. We need to have transactions. Um, fortunately, this is one of those times where open source um, comes to the rescue for you, and uh, we went out and started looking and realized there's already other people out there solving this problem. There's a Tefra project uh, driven mostly by the Cask guys that um, already is out there you can use. Uh, Yahoo has an internal project called OMID2 um, that I'm working to convince them they want to open source so we can use it too. Um, other people also are working on this problem. So this is actually something the community is already taking on for other reasons, so we can just benefit from that. Um, uh, feedback we get a lot of times is, hey, HBase is hard to work with. Now you're going to tell me I have to use it in my Metastore. Um, just to be clear, I'm not telling you you have to. You're certainly welcome to still use your relational database, but we're going to give you that opportunity to do it and hopefully improve your, your experience quite a bit when you do. Um, but, but I want to acknowledge this. Yes, people say HBase is hard to, to use. We need to fix that, right? Just being up front. But hence the picture of the dog with his bowl there. Anything we do there is good anyway, because HBase is already a project in the Hadoop system. If we're making it better because we need to use it, it's just a virtuous feedback loop from our viewpoint, right? We're just making life better for everybody. Um, so what, you know, how does that work out? What's that look like? We just made a new implementation uh, inside Hive to use HBase as a storage engine. So again, you're not, we're not in any way breaking the ability to do it with a relational database. This is additional functionality, not different fun or not replacement. Um, you're still welcome to use the other. Um, it, it turns out you only need like 10 tables in HBase to store all this stuff. Um, that's uh, before you get to some of this more aggressive stats caching. Um, and also, ORMs tend to blow out the data, and Hive's ORM definitely blew out the data. We can actually reduce the data size by quite a bit by uh, undoing the, the normalization. Uh, we have chosen a layout that's highly optimized for select and DML query paths, so any heavy lifting you need to do will be done on the DDL side. So for example, grant, um, one of the things we have to be able to answer very quickly is, when a user comes in, what all roles do they participate in? Because we need to be able to quickly calculate the permissions. You know, do they have permissions to see this data? So we unroll that actually when you do a grant. When you, if you grant a user into a role, we go and figure out exactly what that means, what all um, roles that user is a part of since roles are hierarchical. We're doing that all at DDL time so that it, uh, or, yeah, DDL time, so that at read time, when you issue a select, we just instantly know, okay, this user has access to all these. It's one query. You don't have to basically walk that hierarchy every time. We're also being much more aggressive with a caching. Um, we're going to cache catalog objects just at a query level because you can't cache them beyond that. People can be changing them in the background, and you don't want to, um, you know, if you hold them longer than that, you have a cache and validation question, uh, problem. But stats, we can ag pre-aggregate and cache much more aggressively. If your stats are out of, you know, if you aggregate the stats over a table and then um, I come in and add one more partition, but then somebody else does a query over those stats, if they're off by one partition, it's not the end of the world, right? Stats are uh, approximate anyway, so we can be much more aggressive in the caching there. We actually believe that is where we'll see some of the hugest initial benefit of this system is being able to use those stats and keep them. This also is ongoing work. There's an HBase Metastore branch. Um, you can go there, take a look at it, play with it. Um, there is also a, pay, a wiki page on Hive's wiki on how to actually get this set up, because it, since it's you know, exploratory work, there's, some, there's a few gotchas here and there that you have to, to know about. Um, our intention is to merge this with the LLAP work and release it also as part of this alpha stuff. So it will, again, be out there very soon to use. All right, so I've talked a lot about Hive. Let's pivot a little bit and talk about some things going on in Phoenix. Um, 
I just want to be up front and say I'm much more involved in Hive than Phoenix, so my, the Phoenix part is going to be a little more brief, but I, there are plenty of people here who are very involved with Phoenix, so if I don't give you enough, feel free to ask other people more questions. Um, what is Phoenix? Uh, Phoenix is put SQL back in NoSQL, which, or you know, no longer only SQL, or whatever you want to say NoSQL stands for. But basically the idea is um, HBase is a great key value store, and key value works for a certain set of things, but what people really want is SQL. And um, HBase is great for a set of uh, problems that Hive is not at all good at, right? Hive is very good at analytics type queries, at scanning large data sets. HBase is very, very good at, I need to look up a key or I need to look up a range of uh, continuous keys. You know, find me the user Allen or find me um, maybe every user in this zip code maybe, if you're organized by zip code. Something like that is where HBase is gonna shine. And so C uh, Phoenix puts a SQL interface on top of that. Um, but I think it's interesting to look at some of the things that are happening in, in Phoenix and compare some of, to some of the things that have happened in Hive over time. Um, one is, because people are starting to put their data in HBase and use it for this transactional stuff, now their data is there, it's also, um, it doesn't take long for people to say, well, all my data is there, I don't really want to move it into Hive, let's start adding some of the analytical type, more analytic type functions to Phoenix, um, since that's where my data is, right? So we see um, requests for OLAP functions, more different types of joins and that kind of stuff, and you can see the Phoenix Jira up there that's kind of the one for the OLAP functions. So people are, are pushing to get more analytics functionality into Phoenix, which completely makes sense. Your data's there, you want to work on it. Um, there's work going on to add transactions to Phoenix, um, along with some of those transaction managers that I talked about before. And um, here's something that turns out to be very convenient for us is um, Hive uses a package called Apache Calcite to build its optimizer. And this is, um, and Phoenix uses exactly the same package. So they're, they're already converging a little bit on how they do optimizations, how they do planning for their queries. Or actually, I'm sorry, Phoenix is moving to use Calcite. I don't think that, I went and looked at that JIRA uh, yesterday. I don't think it's closed yet, but at least there's work going on to drive, drive it to where Phoenix would use Calcite for its, its optimization. So how do we, back to our original goal, how do we start to push these together? How can we use these? So I want to start with posing kind of a, how might this look or, or how might this, benefit people. Um, what if these systems, rather than being desperate, could share one driver set, one ODBC, JDBC driver set? What if they could share one SQL dialect? Um, I think that's pretty important for users because they don't necessarily want to think about, oh, my data is here and I access that. This way I attach with this driver set. I use this SQL. My other data is over there. I use this other uh, driver set. I, you know, I use this other SQL. What if Phoenix could leverage the extensive analytics functionality that's already in Hive? If Phoenix didn't have to reinvent all those wheels, but just got immediate access to it, is there a way we can unlock the functionality that Hive's already added? Because Hive's already has multiple join trans uh, implementations. It already has um, uh, analytic functions like rank and row number and all those things. Uh, what if there's some way we could unlock that for Phoenix users so they don't have to wait or, or for the Phoenix developers so they don't have to reinvent that wheel. Um, is there, and what if we could do this in a way that would allow users to access transactional analytics to data together? Because one problem that we see people having is we tell them, okay, if you want to do analytics, put your data in Hive. If you want to do transactional, put your data in HBase. Great, now what happens when I want to join across those? Right? When I need to bring those together, now I'm forced to move one to the other. Not optimal. Right? So is there some way we can deal with this? Um, so as we've thought about this, there are a few things occurred to us that we th uh, think would, are helpful and important. Um, the first insight is this LLAP engine that I spent so long talking about. Um, and here's the payoff of finally of why I spent all this time talking about it. LLAP is a storage engine plus a set of operations that the optimizer can choose to push down to it. Um, there's no reason it has to be the only implementation of that. Right? There's nothing special about LLAP. Can we think about are there ways to put other storage systems there that, that are also, can also take um, 
uh, operation pushdown. The second insight is that since Tez and Spark do the post-shuffle op shuffle operations, they should be able to work with whatever storage system you're using for that initial stuff. So what, basically what this comes down to is what if we enable you to put not just LLAP in there but also HBase? What if you can choose which storage um, you're gonna put your table in, depending on what you wanna do? And then as I've already mentioned, Calcite is used by both Hive and Phoenix, and it turns out to be extremely convenient that Calcite was actually designed specifically with the intent of being able to put together disparate systems like this. So part of its costing model is it already understands, okay, this is how this state is accessed and this is the cost, this state is over here, it has a different cost, and it can reason about what, what, ex, what uh, type of operations it should push to each, when it should move data, all that's already part of its costing model, it already knows how to do that, right? So this is starting to look um, convenient. So I wanna be clear, the other stuff I talked about before is ongoing work. This is, you know, you're into the slideware vision-y stuff, so I just wanna be 100% clear, I'm not selling you something that's gonna be ready next month or anything like this. Um, so, but here's the idea, if you can take LLAP and swap it out with HBase, and your system would have both, and the users would then need to pick where to store their data based on kind of what they want to optimize for. So what does this mean? It means transactions would be more efficient in HBase. If you're doing transactional workloads, you're still going to put them in HBase because it's much, it is faster at that. If you're doing primary key lookups, HBase is going to beat the socks off Hive, right? There's just no way around it. Um, but you could still do analytics over it because the optimizer could still push the necessary operations to HBase and, and come at, the data gets shuffled out of there and uh, handled by Tez just as if it were coming out of LLAP. So they're you get the analytics work in, HBA, or in Phoenix without having to add it all to Phoenix itself. Um, on the other side, tables that were stored in uh, HDFS slash LLAP would be more efficient at analytics, but you can still do transactions. Um, Hive already has added transactions. Um, now you couldn't do OLTP style transactions, but you could do transactional uh, operations on them. And queries that, um, and the important thing here too is with these put together, now you can join across these data sets, right? Now I can, if I've got some query that spans a table that's in HBase, a table that's in HDFS, to me as a user, it's still one query. I say select, um, you know, star from A join B, and I don't have to worry about the fact that A and B are actually in different storage systems. And in this model, we, you know, Phoenix gets used to actually execute all the operations on HBase, Calcite's doing all the planning, um, we get to push all this together. Now, um, I, I don't want to paint a completely rosy picture. There are, there are issues to work on here, right? We have to, uh, Hive and Phoenix have pretty close uh, t data type representation, but not 100%. There'll be some work there to make that work well together um, in an efficient way. Uh, Hive and Phoenix are both working on having transactions. They're not doing it, you know, those, there's a little bit of work to bring those together. And there's some work to do in Calcite to make sure it optimizes transactional queries well. Most, uh, the Hive team and some, uh, some other projects have been pushing Calcite very hard, but mostly on the kind of analytics query world, not a ton yet on the uh, OLTP type query world. So there's some work there to probably, as we start to stretch Calcite in new ways, that will happen anyway in Phoenix, but you know, that'll be something we'll have to deal with. Um, so that's kind of how you could put it all together, and that's the end of my talk, and I'll take questions. Yes? Yes, so I didn't mention the Hive Storage Handler for HBase. So that is true that there is, you can today um, access data that's in HBase from Hive via the Hive Storage Handler. However, that's still very, Hive-centric in that it still spawns a Tez or MapReduce or whatever you're using job, you are not gonna get fast access to HBase that way. Basically what that gives you is if I've got a bunch of data in HBase and I need to do some kind of batch job, I can make it happen. But you're not gonna get to a, you know, a, a faster experience with that. And um, there's been a lot of work on that. It's getting a lot better. Historically it had some tight mismatch problems and stuff. I think a lot of that's been a addressed. 
it's still there, but I, I think our vision is to go a ways beyond what that can do. So the question is, I said you'd have to choose uh, HDFS or, or HBase for storage, and is that just for caching? And no, that would be actually where it's stored. So, I mean, the thing is they store, the two store data very differently, right? So HDFS is gonna store it just as a collection of rows. HBase is gonna organize it by, effectively by primary key, and you're, when you're accessing it, you're gonna be accessing it that way. So that really controls how you can optimally read that data. And so you would need to be a little bit aware of, okay, so I want to do more transactional workloads, so I need to put this in HBase, or I want to do more analytics, I don't care about so much about transactional workloads, so I'm gonna put this in, in HDFS where I'll get a better scan speed. Basically, it's scan versus random lookup is kind of what you're optimizing for there. And when you select LLAP, that's basically you saying HDFS. Yeah, at this point, LLAP and HDFS would, H you, for that purpose, not, this is not completely true, but for that purpose, you can think of LLAP as a cache for HDFS, but it's not gonna do all the primary key stuff, and that, I mean, that's all HBase's world, right? Yes, way in the back. Where does H catalog fit in this? So H catalog fits as it does today, which is, um, I mean, there's still the meta store, right? And that, we're proposing moving it from relational to database to HBase, but that doesn't immediately affect H catalog. It's still there, it's still accessible. Um, so we continue to play the same role of being the way that um, PIG and MapReduce and other tools that want to get into the Metastore can do so. Yes? I, I'm sorry, what I didn't hear? About the high base transactions, yeah. Yes, so there, there would be work, there will be work to put them to somehow marry the transaction stuff. So the hive base transactions actually rely on the meta store underneath for its transactionality. So as we're working on moving the meta store to H base, if we've already got a, um, a transaction layer that we need to have in H base anyway, we can use that, right? Because we're, we're already taking H base and putting Tefra on top to use for transactions for the meta store. Um, we can now start to use that to tr drive the transactionality for the Hive side as well. That's work we haven't done yet. That's kind of in the to-do pile. But um, it, is, it is possible, but it's not zero work, right? There's work to integrate those. Yes? Um, the LLAP is it in memory. Uh, yeah, it's not, re it's not making copies of the data. It's... It is highly optimized to read very efficiently out of HDFS via like local shortcut um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, short circuit read, sorry, that's what it's called. But all of its caching would be in memory. And of course, it, it's got to do some choices. It's got to make some choices about which pieces should I cache and what data is hot and what's the right caching um, algorithm for this data and all that kind of stuff. But that would be choices it would be making based on what it sees users using of the data. So would we need more memory for LLAP? Um, you don't have to have it, but certainly it will use whatever you're gonna give it, right? So uh, one thing I think we haven't done yet is the performance work to really figure out what, how much memory should we give LLAP? Um, that is, we're just not, at this point, we're still on the build it functionally part of the curve. Sorry about that, that was probably loud. Um, we're still on the build it functionally part of the curve. We haven't got to the, okay, now, performance tested and how much memory should we give it versus how much should we give the test containers running behind it. That, that's work we need to do just to figure that out. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have a hard time seeing back there because there's a light, so. Go ahead. I'm sorry, is there not any reason, oh, for the, that the HDFS 
um, not using the HDFS memory tier stuff. Um, yes, there is, but I don't know it. <laughs> um, I know that the um, LLAP guys looked at that and they had some reason they went for not using it directly, but I don't know what it is. You'd have to ask the LLAP. I'm, I've actually been spending most of my time on the HBase Metastore side, not the LLAP side. All right, excellent. Thank you very much.